every single industry in the world is extractive. There's no exception. And extraction is the opposite of regeneration. It, extractive harms people and life and place and water and oceans. And so whether you're looking at service industries or looking at you know, manufacturing industries or technology industries or food, ag, clothing, whatever, they're all extractive. And so the injustice is right there at the beginning, which is they're based on the idea that you can take something from a place and from the future and from someone or someone whose land you stole, right? And call that progress. And it's not progress, it's degeneration. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of The Real Organic Project. We are a grassroots, farmer-led add-on food label. And together with hundreds of farms across the country, we are here to rescue the National Organic Program from corporate corruption. So welcome to The Real Organic Podcast. This is episode two with Paul Hawken. Please subscribe so you don't miss any of the amazing guests we have lined up for the season. They represent every corner of the organic movement and now let's return to the conversation between my co-director, Dave Chapman, and climate activist and author, Paul Hawken. Welcome. I'm talking again today with Paul Hawken. Um, I'm grateful. These conversations are always riveting for me. So, Paul, hello. Hi, Dave. How are you? Good to see Great. you. Great. Really good. Maybe before we dive in to um, regeneration, uh, to go back to our very first interview, because we don't have it on camera, you talked about the early days when you had debates with Professor Stair <laughs> at the Harvard Department of Nutrition. And I, I actually thought it was important. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I will. In some ways, if you go back a little bit further in time, the origin of the organic natural food movement in the United States, uh, it, it led up to those debates for sure. And w what you had is a lot of young people, you know, uh, using plant medicine and then sometimes not responsibly, but in many times guided responsibly. It depended, but it's plant medicine. And there was just like a, a vast illusion it was peeled off a whole generation in terms of food and and nature uh and it really came from plants uh and um and it was really the co-origin of the natural food movement and the other origin were was and um people farmers and and christians and others who never forgot you know, what food should be and how to produce it. You know, Walnut Acres, Paul Keene, and there was, you know, Max Kozak out in LA on produce. You know, there was the, the dip, uh, I mean, the, um, the, there was just farmers here, hither, thither, and yon. And they didn't succumb to the post World War II, um, <clears throat> chemicalization and industrialization of agriculture. They, they just knew it was wrong. And so forth. And those two things sort of merged, you know, which is all of a sudden you had a whole generation, not the whole of it, but I mean, a big part of a generation looking to change its diet completely. And then looking for naturalness and purity. And, uh, and of course that led right to those growers or those provenders, uh, which of which there were very, very few, but, uh, who, uh, knew this all along, you know, or who were startups. Uh, and so, uh, Erwan was a startup and, and, and 66. Um, and we were in Boston 
And Boston has 500,000 students. And so we immediately had, in a sense, a customer base, a client base that wanted to change its diet uh, from uh, dorm food or uh, you know, university food or college to cafeterias. Um, and as, we, as it rose in prominence, uh, and it grew very quickly, it, it wasn't just sort of there, and it, it really exploded. And of course, there was magazine articles and newspaper articles, and there was a lot of um, mocking uh, in the press, mockery and sort of cutesy, you know, titles and, you know, and, but it got to the point where the Department of Nutrition at Harvard University, Dr. Fred Stair, became aware of it. And he was being challenged by um, journalists and students uh, as to his stance, as to where he stood since he was the doyen of nutrition in the United States. I mean, if there was one, it'd be Fred Stair. And he served on, you know, the boards of directors of, of, of big food companies and the National Sugar Council. And I mean, it was amazing, you know, from our point of view, not his, of course, but from our point of view, the conflicts of interest that were there in terms of science. I mean, you know... And he infamously, infamously said, you know, that a calorie is a calorie is a calorie and your body can't tell the difference whether it's from a black bean or a piece of kale or sugar. And, 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 and he certainly believed that. It wasn't like he was defending, you know, junk food so much as he sincerely believed that the body was an assemblage of pieces and parts and molecule, molecules that interfaced with food, which is a assemblage of pieces and parts and molecules. <laughs> and they, they worked it out, you know, like I'll, I'll take one of those and, uh, you know, one of those and, and, and that that could assemble muscle tissue and nerves and, um, et cetera. And so, um, those debates, we were debating and I have to say, I always, kind of got the short end, not because I didn't know what I was talking about in terms of organic food, but I mean, he was a fount of, you know, nutritional, what we know now, but nutritional um, orthodoxy uh, and with language and code words and that, you know, were very impressive. I mean, he was from Harvard and he was a, he was a very nice man and he was very articulate and he was very intelligent. So uh, he wasn't a doofus or something, you know, like like a spokesperson or something. He was the real deal. Um, but he was also irritated by the natural food movement, very irritated by it. I don't know why. I guess it challenged something or he was dismissive. And I do remember one debate, uh, I think it was at MIT of all things, uh, and Dr. Maria Linder was there who was a, a PhD teacher at MIT, who actually was very much into biodynamics. Very interesting. That was, I, to this day, I praise her to the skies that she was there. <laughs> um, and she was the one who said, when Fred Stair was always talking about the way we would eat would end up with beriberi and different diseases because it was nutritionally deficient. And especially B12, which is cobalmin, you know, and, uh, she interrupted him and said, you know, Dr. Stair, anybody who's eating vegetables is getting B12 because it's dirt. <laughs> it's, it's, you find it in dirt. You just need a incredibly small amount of cobalt, you know. <laughs> um, but it was at that debate where he said that, uh, basically, you know, um, we were basically, lab rats experimenting, you know, and, and th th we should st stick to a conventional diet to, for our own health and well-being and so forth and not promulgate a different way of eating to people, you know. Um, and definitely the term food fattest came up. I don't know if it came from, up from the moderator or from Dr. Stair, so I, 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 I can't remember, but it definitely came up that we were food fattest. And this came up often in, the, in, in, in articles, you know, 
the new food fad or, you know, food fattest say or claim. And, you know, as if we were all food fattists, you know, like a, a term we hadn't known about before. And, um, and that's when I said to him, you know, with all due respect, I might not have said that then. I, I'm trying to think. I was trying to be polite, but anyway, I said, you know, you know, what you're, most of what you're eating. Oh, I know what I first did is I, I actually licked my finger and I said, and I said, lick your finger to Dr. Stair, lick your finger. And he, he didn't want to do it. I said, well, I'll lick my own. And I said, but anyway, if we lick our finger, there's at least 300 chemicals that are in our saliva that were invented since World War II. And that's true for everybody. And I said, so from our point of view, we're eating foods that were here pre-biblical times. And most of what you're eating are concoctions that were invented since World War II, along with the chemicals that are in them. So from our point of view, you're the food fattest, we're the conservatives, and we're going to see how it works out for you. And, and you know, because it, it, it was really a, a figure ground flip that needed to be put out at that time, which is like, hey, we're not we're not happy. We're not, we're concerned about what people are eating. You know, this is new. Uh, we're the people who go like, let's eat the molecules, you know, from the earth, you know, that the, it has evolved over, you know, thousands, actually millions of years because every seed, even if, even if it's corn, you say, well, corn was developed, you know, 9,000 years ago, you know, um, from a, a a wild plant, yeah, but that wild plant goes back how many years and how many years and how many years and so for seeds, you know, go back millions of years, you know, and there's intelligence in those seeds and and that's what we wanted to eat. <laughs> so that was, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a pretty legitimate question about who is the lab rat here, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, the diet you're proposing has been. Tested for a very long time. His is really radically new in evolutionary terms. I know. And if you look at the, the CDC, the NIH, if you look at the, 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 the data points on disease right now in the United States and children, one out of 35 boys, one out of 35 is, that are born now has autism. I mean, when I was growing up, we never even heard that term. We never heard of it, much less, you know, we went to school with hundreds and even thousands of people. We never, we never met or heard or encountered somebody who was autistic, you know, not that I wouldn't have wanted to, but I'm just saying it just, we just didn't see it, you know, maybe some Asperger's for sure, but, but not, not full spectrum autism. And one out of 35, and that was from 100 and I think 40, only 15 years ago. So, I mean, the, I mean, that's just autism. I mean, there, there's a whole list of diseases, you know. Um, and so it's still that correlation is sort of being made, you know, between the American diet, you know, the U.S. diet and, uh, and disease vectors, but, and, and, and chronic disease, you know, and, but still there's, a, you know, the new si the new guidelines just came out just, what, a month ago, you know? And you look at the companies that sit on the scientific advisory board and the council and, you know, Coke and... <laughs> and it's still okay to eat 10% of your calories from white sugar or sugar, right? You know, it's like, which is like, you know, I mean, that's a lot of sugar, you know, to, for, to get 10% of your calories from sugar. John Gusau, uh, yesterday in my discussion group, talked about um, how entrenched and conservative the, the academic nutritionist community is. And it's very hard to get them to see things differently. And, and I think that, you know, Dr. Stair was a, a, a you know, a, a perfect representation of that. It, but it continues to this day. There certainly are nutritionists who think differently, but um, there's this massive weight that's very hard to shift. I coined a term for the new book, which uh, I'm not going to talk about the new book, but the, I think the term is interesting, and I call it stolen health. 
And that's what Coke and Pepsi and junk food people are engaged in. They're stealing the health of our youth. Now, look at when I grew up, there was Coke, you know, and it was in a bottle and, you know, you could buy it and drink it. But we did not get inundated with superstar, you know, influencers and advertising and clever, clever ads to drink more and more and more. You know, I mean, it was like, it was a treat, no question, you know. And uh, little did we know that we were getting caffeinated, which is kind of cool when you're, you know, nine. Um, but, but, but today, I mean, even the, the, when the food stamps come out, you know, they come out once a month, they're issued in every food desert in the United States. There is all of a sudden uh, all these ads about Doritos and Lay's and Gatorade and well, probably not Gatorade, Mountain Dew, Pepsi, you know, Coke Zero for that week. Because as what Joan Gustav was saying, I mean, you, the influence on the USDA is such that you can use food stamps to buy junk food, right? Yeah. And um, so it's a, uh, it's to me, it's literally a crime against humanity. Yeah. Literally. Yeah, so um, it's a very, very hard ship to turn. Uh, the food culture is so, it's got so much momentum. There's so much money tied up in it. What are your thoughts about that? You know, how, how can you imagine changing that? Well, of course, you you change it by individual choice, um, but it, which is crucial. But you have to change it with policy. I was I was so interested, and I confess to say disappointed in President Biden's or President-elect Biden's choice for agricultural secretary because uh, Vilsack has such deep ties to big ag. If you could disaggregate big ag from big food, well, that would be one thing. But the reason big ag does what it does is to supply ingredients for big food. I mean, and so they're symbiotes, absolutely, you know. Uh, um, and they're enablers of each other and uh, in a sense they um um they rule and uh, they rule dietary guidelines they rule rule USA policy they rule the crop insurance i mean all, all the things that really um militate against uh, real change in this country uh are bought and paid for by big egg and big food through the USDA. Um, and I, and it's for the most venal reasons that we accept that. And that's because you have Iowa, you have these <laughs> states that are pivotal every four years, you know, in terms of, you know, presidential politics. And so every president wants to be sure, you know, Democrat or Republican, that, you know, those states are not, don't see them as radical in terms of agriculture. Of course, they lost that vote during the Trump administration anyway. So I don't see why they were pandering to it because, they, you know, but I, I do think that um, there's a movement afoot though, which I have never really seen in the same way. There was always food localization happening with natural foods from the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, which is, and then what happened is Whole Foods came in and um, out of Austin and started buying up natural food stores and actually natural food stores, they had bought up other natural food stores. And it was kind of like, you know, that thing, the fish, the little fish, you buy the big fish, buy the big fish, buy the bigger fish, you know. And Whole Foods, you know, became the, the big fish. And now they're bought up by even a bigger fish, which is Amazon. But the point being is that there was um, a lot of farmers and, and, and uh, preventers and, you know, producing food that was specific to an area, whether it was, you know, bakery goods or um, 
whether whether there was a produce as, as such or things that you made from produce and so forth in the deli and things like that. So there was basically, um, you know, a food network developing and a food system from New England to, you know, San Diego. I mean, it was the whole country. When, when in seven years at Erwan, we had over 3,000 different wholesale accounts. And these are all natural food stores. And, um, and they were distributed very, uh, proportionate to a population. Well, not quite proportionate. New England was disproportionate. There's more there. <laughs> but, but, but overall, you know, they were everywhere. And there's no question about it, you know, from Florida to Texas, you know, all up to, you know, Montana. And they were all our customers, not all that existed, but I mean, we had a lot of them as customers. And then, what happened is that as they um, were bought out, then uh, and purchasing was centralized, and so uh, farmers who small farmers and small producers who were making a living, um, maybe hard scrabble, but no, it's making a living in their locale. All of a sudden, could not provide the amount of goods that Whole Foods needed. That was, and so they went to vendors who could supply a whole region as opposed to a state or part of a state or a city. Uh, and, and a, a lot of, a lot of people went out of business. A lot of farmers went out of business, organic farmers. And, and what saved a lot of them actually was there was a rise in, in restaurants, you know, starting with Alice Waters and others, you know, who started saying, well, wait, what is food? <laughs> And I remember interviewing Alice once and, um, about her cooking. And this was years ago. And she was saying that, you know, the Savaran school of, of cuisine and cooking was, you know, give me enough butter and cream and I'll make a boot taste good. In other words, that all the genius was in the kitchen, you know, and, and not in the ingredients. Now that really wasn't true in France. The ingredients were amazing, but they, they, they didn't know that they're like fish in a bowl. They didn't know what water was. French didn't understand that they had really, really good produce and food. But nevertheless, uh, that was the thinking. And she said, what I do is buy the very, very best ingredients. And what I try to do is not to fuck them up in the kitchen. That was a direct quote. <laughs> so again, that figure ground shift, you know, and to buy the best ingredients, you know, it means you had to go to the farm, you know, you had to, well, why you had to taste it, of course, but also, how is it produced? And so she formed those relationships. And those farmers existed because of natural food stores and others. But uh, but once she did that, uh, many others did. I mean, it was like a, it was almost simultaneous. But and and then it's, that spread all over the country, and and that was kind of a lifeline to the small farmers and 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 uh, basically uh, artisanal producers. You know, um, but. The what's happened with COVID uh, and prior to that, but sort of come to the fore is a deeper level of localization. In other words, it is trying, it's food sovereignty, it's divorcing the, uh, our dependency on the food system entirely uh, or as much as possible. And you see that with Leah Panaman at Soul Fire Farm and near Albany, you know, which is, she wrote, you know, Farming While Black, but I mean, not just localizing food for Albany, where she and her husband and her children live and were living in a food desert and, 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 and really starting to serve the people and in that community. Um, but they're, they're also bringing back the, the, um, self-respect and knowledge that, uh, African American farmers had and brought to this country. Um, and we don't really know that story. We know that story once George Washington Carver, Tuskegee, and then Booker T. Watley. We know it from that. But what we don't know is that, you know, Ghanaian, you know, in her case, Krobo women and, you know, who were uh, trapped and, and captured and enslaved and, you know, taken, you know, by people they didn't know on to a place they didn't know for reasons they didn't understand. But they had the wisdom amazingly to put seeds in their hair <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know 
and rice and, and, and vegetables and, and traditional foods. And that came to America. And you know, the, the reason we know they were regenerative farmers is because they were doing it for a thousand years. And if you grow food a thousand years in one place, you better know what you're doing. And, um, and so that very much became respected, oddly enough, by in the, the, these recruits in the Atlantic slave trade became recruited by these plantation owners, you know, for the cotton and for peanuts and for the crops that they were growing, the commodity crops, but also for other crops. And so, uh, so Leah is bringing that history back, but also, you know, the, the theft of, you know, black land in the South, you know, in the fifties and sixties. And, um, so that's one type of localization, you know, which is linking place and food and food ways to culture you know, and, and, uh, whether it's Latinx, which isn't, wasn't quite as divorced from it, brought it from, you know, Mexico and, and Mesoamerica, but, uh, it's happening there. And so there is this, uh, amazing, um, emergence, uh, and, uh, that I see in the United States on food localization that does not take care of the food system until our children are protected and educated in our schools and that there's not vending machines and that the big food companies cannot influence what is served in for breakfast in the cafeteria, the amount of sugar, the amount of crap, the amount of junk that's being served to our children uh, in those schools and where they get it. And um, not only that, but, you know, the, the, the indigenous people, uh, the uh, peoples of this land, you know, there was 590 tribes when we, when the colonists got here and so forth. But we're still dumping commodity foods into the reserva- so-called reservations. These are their lands, their tra- traditional lands, but, um, and, uh, and they've gotten accustomed to those foods, you know. And so you're seeing also a resurgence of, uh, Native, uh, Native Americans, you know, trying to recapture and restore and regenerate their food ways, uh, which in the Sioux and the Lakota and the, uh, uh, Potawatomi, I mean, you, you see it in the Pueblo, you, you see it in, in the, uh, Hopi, uh, Hopis, you see it in the Diné. Um, so you, you're seeing that happen as well, you know. Yeah. So there are these diverging movements and, you know, at the same time that we see a more local food movement growing, which is the most uh, exciting and encouraging development, we see this vertical integration of corporate agriculture, um, which is pretty dismaying. And it's happening. I mean, you know, it, uh, the local food movement is growing dramatically, but the, the impact of that vertical integration affects everybody, affects the whole economy. It's, it's huge. Um, so w- one of the things that I'm encountering more and more is this movement of technology, high technology and artificial intelligence into food. And we can't call it farming quite, but it, let's say food manufacturing, you know, but of, of basics. So, you know, of of vegetables, of fruits, berries, um, you know, plenty, the walls of green, uh, fake meat, all these things are happening. Um, and one of the um, innovators, one of the large investment funds that uh, is really moving into this, uh, I heard a talk, a very interesting guy, and he said, you know, until the last 20 years, really the major innovation in agriculture was to motorize the ox. And, you know, we got tractors and we now did exactly what we did with an ox just faster. But now we're getting artificial intelligence and these systems thinking and distribution and it's all being tied together and things are going to change. You have any thoughts about that? A lot of thoughts. (laughs) Yes, I do. (laughs) Uh, there's so many ways into that one. Um, the, uh, the idea that mechanization of an ox was the breakthrough is really ignorant. The, 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 you know, I mean, the breakthrough was NPK, that is to say, um, 
19th century <clears throat> um, you know the the, the Haber Bosch process you know that basically would inexpensively um, synthesize not synthesize took out of the air but nitrogen you know and make it bioavailable uh, in the soil to plants okay so that that was that was the big turning point and it was treated in Europe with great enthusiasm because their soils were really screwed up. I mean, they, they weren't farming properly and, and there was crop failure and there was starvation and there, there, you know, they didn't know what they were doing, frankly. Now this compares to indigenous people in, or what, you know, in Japan and Korea and China and India, you know, all through the Americas, you know, Mesoamerica, I mean, uh, Africa, who didn't have that problem, <laughs> you know, in terms of exhausting their soils, you know. You saw it a little bit in, you know, slash and burn, you know, which is the rotational thing in, in, in definitely in, in, in forest cultures, you know. Uh, we had very thin acidic soils, you know, and they would, but they did it in a very sustainable way. Um, but uh, it was Europe that had the problem. And so, boy, you put that, you know, nitrate on and it was green and tall, taller and abundant. And it was like, hallelujah. So that was, that was the turning point. Um, and the idea that somehow there hasn't been other breakthroughs from their point, from that point of view, there's been many breakthroughs. And it wasn't just the mechanization of the ox. It was the idea that a farmer could farm, farm, excuse me, at 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 acres, you know or that farming could be industrialized, that you could have 10 of those farms or five of those farms under a corporate holding company, you know. Um, and as Wendell Berry makes very clear, you know, good farming uh, depends on eyes, you know. You, you want to walk your fields. You want to know your soil. You got to know what's going on there. And so even up before now in the technologies that he's talking about and so forth, uh, there was a tendency to basically erase that um, uh, sensibility and that connection to the land. Um, it wasn't that farmers didn't see, you know, oh, there's Canadian thistle there and I've got to out. I mean, they, they knew what was going on, but, but not to the extent that um, required an understanding of why, why it was going on. So they could use herbicides, they could use pesticides, they could cover up the, um, the, the losses of fertility and the loss of plant, uh, health. Uh, and, and of course, and then they were able to, uh, plant and harvest huge, huge swaths of formerly, uh, productive grasslands and, 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 and turn them into, uh, croplands. Um, but what you see now, though, when, in people are talking about it, especially the Mon buyer Monsantos and other companies, you know, is that, um, you know, they're really excited about remote sensing and satellite imagery and, you know, AI, which is, you know, analyzing what's going on in a more granular way. Okay. Supposedly. And I don't question it really, but that's what they're saying. Uh, whether it's moisture, um, or fertility and other gases that they're measuring from, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know, 10, 10, 50 miles up in the air. Um, and using that information to do what? To enable industrial agriculture. And so if anything, they're moving further away from a healthy agricultural system. They're, answer to regenerative agriculture or an agriculture that's really based on observational science as opposed to laboratory science uh, and uh, is to expand it, make it even bigger. And so it's very much a, a, a way of thinking that comes out from, you know, big tech and, 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 and engineering and, and, you know, the ubiquity of satellites and the, the inexpensiveness they are, they're very inexpensive now and so forth. And then the correlate to that, of course, is the, uh, what's happening in Silicon Valley. The 
the idea of you know printing food, you know, food is software that you can basically invent food or reinvent food, um, which I find charmingly crazy. <laughs> Charming in the sense of like, really? <laughs> Did you ever have a garden? <laughs> It's so interesting because, you know, the average child can only, can, can't name more than 20 foods. Ask, try it. They can't. And there's 63,000 edible foods on this planet. Okay. 63,000. And so, and so you have people who probably still can't name 20 plants or foods, you know, working in laboratories, working with molecules again, breaking stuff down, okay, and then reassembling it, you know, in a way that can be mass produced, you know, um, <clears throat> and they have no idea what's out there. They have no idea what food is. Because if you take a human body and you break it down into parts and pieces and analyze it, you don't know what a human body is. But you definitely know a lot about it in terms of parts and pieces, no question about it. You know, you can, but the only way you can understand a human body is when it's alive and in one piece. And, um, uh, and so the same sort of mindset is being applied to food. Uh, and so what, again, to, in my new work, I have a, a, a thing called uninventing food, which not inventing food, uninventing it, you know, because we already are starving. We don't have real food now. And mostly, most of the people in the United States don't have good food. And now we're going to invent it? What? Come on. We should uninvent what we've already created and go back so people can be fully nourished, you know, because that nourishment is what connects them, you know, to in far, in, in very deep and, and I would say almost mystical ways. Uh, to the earth and the heaven and heaven. This is what indigenous people have told us forever and have practiced. And I'm, I'm taken by a, a story that Pfeiffer, uh, Aaron Fried Pfeiffer, who really was the, the creator. I mean, Steiner is given credit, but the creator of biodynamic method of farming. And he talked about coming back from, uh, I think it was in the twenties or something where he's with Steiner and Steiner has been giving his indications. It's a lecture, a talk, but they call it indications. And uh, when they're going back on a horse-drawn wagon, of all things, sitting in the back, <laughs> and uh, he was talking to Steiner and he's saying, you know, people are taking notes, but they really didn't get what you were saying. They didn't really understand it, you know. And, and Steiner said, yeah, I know. And he said, let me tell you why. And, um, and then he sort of drew a, a, you know, a picture of a human being, a stick figure, and then a curve on the dust in this wagon, you know, the dust, you know. And he said, and he, that was the earth, you know, and the, there's this, you know, stick figure. <laughs> and he said, the, the person has been cut off from the earth due to MPK. And MPK was a big deal in Germany then, you know, I mean, and fertilizers. He said, they're cut off from the information, from the, he used other words and so forth, you know, but from the earth. And he said, once you're cut off from that, he said, you're cut off from that, from heaven. In other words, you're no longer a receiver. And you need the grounding to be a receiver. And that's what inspired Pfeiffer to create the biodynamic agriculture, you know, movement. With Steiner, of course, being very much the teacher um, and so what we're talking about with, you know, inventing food software, food printing food, you know, uh, is, is basically a further, uh, disruption and disconnection of human beings from the earth. Um, as if somebody could assemble the knowledge of every little thing you need when we still don't even know what's in a seed or food itself and, or how it really works. You know, uh, and how to adaptogenic, you know, plants do what they do. We have guesses and then we'll isolate something, you know, resveratrol, you know, from Japanese knotweed or something like that. And it does have big effects, you know, um, but the Japanese knotweed has bigger effects than that, you know, and, and so the, the, 
the complexity, the subtlety, and the completeness of our relationship to the land um, is being further severed by um, what's happening in food tech. Yeah, what you're saying is very important. Um, it, it reminds me of something that Stuart Hill said uh, yesterday in the session, which is that he talked about the difference between deep science and shallow science. Mm. And uh, he said shallow science is you take a, take a mouse and you put it in a cage and give it a shot and then you write a paper on what happens next. And I think that that's right, that, that I think what he meant by shallow science is when you're reducing, when you're separating and you're studying pieces. And um, mm -hmm. deep science would be studying systems, studying interrelationships, immensely more complex. You have thoughts about that? Uh, very much so. I mean, the genius of, of the Western mind is that science. And, and it is genius. And you, you isolate and then you study and you eliminate variables so you can understand the um, differences, the deltas, you know, the activity, the action, the influence, you know, of, of uh, a component, a molecule, uh, atoms too, of course, but, and, um, and that's been done to ag, it's been done to the human body, it's been, you know, and there's amazing things you can learn when you eliminate all that there are, and then you can apply them. Um, but it's so incomplete and so dangerous. It is brilliant, incomplete and dangerous, you know, all, all three of those things. And um, how would you create a pesticide if you couldn't do that? That's how you create a pesticide, right? How do you, I mean, um, how do you create all the things that come out of uh, an oil well in terms of fossil fuels if you couldn't separate and isolate and polymers and gases and chemicals and pesticides that come out of the oil well? They come out, but you, they're not seen, you know, until you separate it out and then you start testing and seeing what things do, you know. Um, so that is shallow science for sure, the way he'll use the term. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. It's what's wrong with it is that it's disintegrated. In other words, um, from a systems point of view and a systems understanding. And um, the reason that uh, I emphasize uh, uh, indigenous um, knowledge and wisdom in the new book is simply because I, I, I said they know they know where they live. First of all, we don't. We really don't know where we live. Why do they know where they live? Well, because they've been there for, you know, 1,000, 3,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000, we don't know, years. And the, the learning you have in place is what I call observational science, which is you see things, patterns, you see things over and over. You do things, maybe you plan something, maybe you do this, you know, so forth. But I mean, you have this, incredible memory and basis of knowledge to understand how to adapt, change, amend, you know, what you're doing in place. And there's two stories here. One is uh, Norman Myers, who um, wrote The Primary Forest in uh, Cambridge, described going out into the primary forest of Borneo and, and the primary forests uh, at that time were considered virgin, untouched, untainted, you know, humans never really affected them. You know, this is, you know, you know, the, <laughs> um, paradise, you know, all that sort of stuff. And he went out with an ethnobotanist and they walked out into the forest and then they stopped. And they spent a the whole day in one place. And that day, the ethnobotanist just kept turning degree by degree by degree by degree and, and then described exactly what they were seeing in terms of trees and plants. And uh, after the day was over, um, it became apparent way before then that everything they saw was put there by a human being. Everything. In other words, the diversity of that forest 
could never have been achieved in a natural succession of a forest. And what people, who were they, you know, for tens of thousands of years, these are 40,000 year old forests, did is when these big trees would come down, you know, and crash and the huge trees and they would take other trees with them and then there'd be sunlight and opening. And then they would take seeds and cuttings, you know, and basically plant them <laughs> for what? For food, for medicine, for fiber, right? For the things that they needed. And they just kept doing that, you know, for you know, tens of thousands of years. And that is the primary forest that you were seeing. And so just the same thing happened in here in California. I mean, you know, when the Spanish came and then the English later, but the English interestingly said, gosh, the, the San Joaquin Sacramento Valley looks like Hyde Park. It was so well groomed and there was all this space between the oak trees and, you know, huge, huge, you know, uh, lily, um, gardens almost really what you call them growing around you know uh and the animals were, were not running away you had to push away you know the elk and and antelope and and you know and it was, what is this place you know and it was farmed <laughs> by california's uh 60 indigenous cultures and um so we don't we we we, when we go back to in, in, in indigenous people, it's a, what we're seeing is like a, a, a way of understanding place where you're not separate. And we look at place as it's separate from us or we're separate from it. So all that shallow science comes from othering, from itting. It's an it. It, 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 you know, and we're in it, but we're, but we're we're the top of the it's and um and so out of that comes mistakes and misunderstanding really uh and um and that's that's where we are right now and so going back to food localization what's going on i i mean i really feel that people are feeling that and sensing that and wanting you know in this age of artifice, you know, to actually experience what it means to be a human being. And the only way you can experience that is to go outside, be outside, be on this planet, walk on it, you know, smell it, know it, taste it, touch it. Um, there is no other way to be a human being because that's how we evolved. We didn't evolve separately from anything on the planet. Uh, and so that respect and that understanding that is integral to indigeneity um, is something that uh, I feel like is going to come back. And you say, well, why? And it's going to come back because of the weather. That's why. And um, the weather, curiously, is our ally in, in a funny way because the rate at which people will move to from a broken food system, which we saw in COVID, uh, to food systems that are resilient and localized, adapted and adaptive, is going to be abetted and forwarded by weather. Because everyone's got to eat and everyone wants to think their food is available and is dependable. It is not going to be unless... There is this um, uh, um, reintegration of food into place. Uh, and you even have, you know, um, now uh, milpa, milpa type uh, fields being planted. The biggest food desert in the world is not in uh, New York, Chicago, Oakland, uh, LA. The biggest food desert in the world is the Midwest, where the farmers are. And they can't get good food for the life of them. And most of them have forgot to can and grow the, stu the darn stuff, you know. Um, my parents were, were farmers, my grandparents, and they, pff, I mean, that would, we could have lived two years on their farm <laughs> if nothing happened. I mean, you go in the basement, oh my gosh, it was all there, you know. And, and that's, I learned to can when I was six, you know. But the milpa is, came out of the, you know, the, the traditions in Mesoamerica of corn, you know, uh, uh, beans and, and squash being grown together, you know. 
and um, very much the companion planning that later was became a, came out of biodynamics, you know. But what what the the what's happening is there's a seed company in Nebraska and it's giving you free seed if you plant a milk or garden in an acre. And it's got 30 plus different seeds. It's got vegetables and greens, obviously squash. It's got fruits and berries and so forth. And you just drill them, cross drill and drill them. And, and that's it. And there's a one acre garden and these gardens are being opened up to church groups and to people who are on food stamps or people who don't have enough money or just or um, Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts who want to pick it and then go sell it at a farm stand and make some money for their whatever they're doing. And so you're seeing, even in Big Ag, you're seeing saying, we're starving. We're starving. We're growing, you know, food for CAFOs and, you know, uh, Frito-Lay, but, we're, but we ourselves uh, are not doing well. So it's really, it's, I, I, I see something going happening that's really interesting. So, okay, that's really interesting. And it takes us into um, the ch- huge elephant in our room, you know, the climate and the change. And w- one of the things that makes climate mm, so overwhelming is that I actually can do my garden and I can do it entirely regeneratively in every wonderful way. And I will still get hit by a tidal wave that was not of the making of my square mile and that we are learning that we are all connected the whole planet and that there there literally is no place to hide that there might be places that will be less devastated for a while but but it's a big system and i think it's a huge it's a huge shift in human understanding to see that and to go oh we're actually all in this together i uh, I was really impressed uh, hearing one of Al Gore's talks when he talked about, he wasn't talking about the effect of agriculture on climate, he's talking about the effect of climate on agriculture and the devastation that is being wrought around the world on agriculture through climate change. And that the result of that is these millions of climate refugees who are fi- trying to find some place to stay alive. So they're going to places like Europe and America, and, uh, and that in the process, they are part of a massive destabilization of the political systems of these countries and a fairly radical turn towards these alt-right governments, which are popping up all over the world. India has got this, you know, extremely regressive leader, and, you know, one of his things is to build a wall between India and Bangladesh. To keep them out. So, what are your thoughts about us poor humans trying to make a leap to a different understanding and then to a way of acting as a, a mutual aid, mutual aid uh, band of brothers and sisters? Yeah, just a. Uh, 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 Short, brief question, right? Uh, <laughs> it's a really good question. Really, really good. And um, uh, there's a lot of facets to that question. The, 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 the migration and the increased migration that will occur is a kind of a lagging indicator. In other words, it came, it, it's not a leading indicator. Um, and it has momentum. And the momentum again is caused by weather, um, and crop failure and crop loss and food. And especially when you have people who, uh, are living year to year on the food they can produce or that's being produced around them, you know, and, uh, then there's no resiliency, uh, to hurricanes and droughts, uh, and such. So, you know, I, you know, I was talking to somebody high up in the EU and he said the, 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 the fear that, the, the fear that is unspoken. In other words, nobody can talk about it is not the migrants that are coming from Syria or Libya. Um, it's, they predict there, there'll be a hundred million to 200 million 
migrants moving north in Africa. And there were people just like trees and plants and animals, you know, <laughs> we're going to move to where water and food is. I mean, it's, just, it's natural. Um, how do you be humane when people who are suffering show up at your doorstep? Interesting question, you know. So, um, and that's true with the United States too, you know, because it's on the path to water and to food. And, um, and so one thing is that regenerative agriculture is, I think, much broader than is typically presented to people, you know, and like, oh, no till and, you know, complex cover and, you know, in animal integration and, you know, keep alive roots in the ground. All true, all brilliant, all wonderful. But it's more complex than that. And it's complex because when it's practiced, it's practiced in place. And and so it's adapted to place. It's not like one, you know, technique fits all. It does not. And, uh, and that's its benefit as, a, as opposed to industrial ag where, you know, and so what you saw, I think three, four weeks ago, Nestle. Okay. Biggest food company in the world. Pretty much by far. I think they're twice as big as second place. What did they announce? Regenerative agriculture for 500,000 farmers in Ghana, in Cote d'Ivoire, Ecuador, Peru, because they've been around a long time and they have farmers there that are fifth generation, that have been the same family for five generations. So it's not like big egg and, you know, Nestle, we need some, you know, cacao, we need some chocolate, we need coffee. They're dealing with smallholders everywhere in those countries and others. And they have for a long time. And what those farmers and what Nestle's seeing is different levels of heat, dryness, rain, all the things that were predicted um, about uh, climate change and the impact it's having on plant yield and on income uh, for these farmers. And so what they're going to promulgate, what they're going to teach and what they're going to co-evolve with their farmers, that is, they don't know either, no one knows really, but there are experts, is to create regenerative agricultural practices for their 500,000 smallholder farmers in the world. Um, who could have predicted that a year ago, two years ago, five years ago? I mean, it would have been, what are you talking about, you know? Um, and so... The, 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 so what we have to do is go to Nicaragua, go to Guatemala, go to places that are being hit by, you know, extreme weather for sure. And, uh, and start to work in those places with people and to understand what can be done. There is a really great photograph. I have to find it, uh, after the derecho in Iowa. And it shows a fence line right down the middle of the photograph on one side. The field is completely flooded. I mean, that crop is, I mean, it's just, the water is pooled, you know. On the other side, there's no water at all. That side was regenerative. The other side wasn't. So it's not that there is a built-in immune system with regenerative agriculture. It's not. Weather is weather. But there is a built-in a capacity. And I think one of the things that hasn't been emphasized enough about regenerative agriculture to me is the hydrological cycle or hydrology or water itself. I mean, if it did nothing else, but basically change the percolation rates of water and how much water can be held in the soils and then how much resilience that creates in terms of uh, variation in rainfall uh, and plant resilience and plant adaptivity and root uh, structure that is be able to go down deeper um, would be enough. That would be enough. That was why we should do it worldwide, you know, because the water cycle is getting, you know, very erratic. Um, the 
And, um, so, um, there's a lot we can do instead of, you know, saying, you know, trying to think of ourselves as, um, the way, um, Modi's thinking about India, which is to wall them off, uh, whoever they are, uh, is to go to, go to and, and learn together and change and transform and figure out what is it that's nobody, nobody wants to leave their home. Nobody. So it takes a lot to take, you know, for a husband and a wife and two small children to start walking. That is a crazy, crazy thing to do to a place you don't know the language or the people, you don't have a job, you have nothing, you have no belongings, you can't carry anything except clothes on your back. So that, that migration is not the, not in deep down, it's not what we want to do, not what people want to do. So what can we do to actually work with that as in, as opposed to fight it or repel it or, you know, try to prevent it from happening and so forth, you know? from a defensive point of view, you know. Um, okay, I, I have to ask, um, do you believe Nestle? I, I just have to ask, because right now we're seeing an explosion in the corporate world of embracing regenerative agriculture. And they're all there. I mean, McDonald's and Walmart and, and Cargill and uh, you name it, they're embracing it. Bear Monsanto is embracing carbon farming and sustainable. And I have to say, if they're all telling the truth, I feel like we can go and sit on the porch and drink wine because I think we've just solved the climate crisis. But I don't think we can do that because I don't think we have. But it is a promising thing if they're moving in that direction. What do you think? Well, in some cases, I know. That is, I know the CEOs of different companies. And I agree with you, by the way. And there's uh, a lot of regen light going on here, which is, oh, what a great word. <laughs> and uh, it's being used to, um, I don't know, it's, 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 it's kind of soil washing, you know. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I mean, um, and, and you kind of, it's, it's cringeworthy. I, I mean, frankly, you know. Um, and sustainability took a long time, a relatively long time to become a weasel word. Where it, what does it mean? Well, we're sustainable. And, uh, regenerative and regenerative ag became a weasel word really quick, you know, which, well, what is it? What do you mean? You know, um, and I would say in the case of, uh, Nestle's, I do know. And the reason I take them seriously is because they know they don't know. And furthermore, they have no benefit at all from doing anything other than what will act, absolutely create the results of regenerative agriculture. Whereas Bayer Monsanto, Cargill, et al. do benefit from having, you know, I mean, regen light is a polite term, actually. It's regen bullshit. And they do benefit from it because they're pulling, you know, the wool over people's eyes and using that as a way to basically get permission to do what they've always done and continue to do, right? So I take Nestle very seriously. They take it seriously from a pragmatic point of view. Now, when you have a half a million farmers, it's a very, very different situation than what, say, Cargill does or what Monsanto, Bayer Monsanto, what Syngenta, what DuPont. I mean, that's big, big ag for big food, you know, and they think in a different way. They can't think smallholder. They don't care about smallholders. It is meaningless to them in terms of revenue and so forth. They're trying to get rid of smallholders, for God's sakes, you know. Um, and, and they are, they're doing a good job. They're marginalizing them. And, um, but in those crops, it doesn't work. It doesn't work in those areas and in those forests, you know, and it doesn't work to, to try to marginalize them. 
And furthermore, with Nestle, these are old relationships. These aren't, you know, some of the 60s or the 70s or the 80s or something. They go back to the 19th century. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so, or maybe the early 20th century, I forget, but I mean, they go back a long, long time. And so that, those, are, those are social relationships, not commodity relationships. So that's a, a big d- d- a div- d- divider right there. You know, cargo is a, is a commodity relationship. And one of the things, again, I, I speak about in terms of aspects of regenerative agriculture is decommodification. You have to decommodify uh, weed and corn and soy and other crops. And Car- Cargill will, will buy organic. They'll buy non-GMO. They'll buy GMO. They, they don't care. If the customers want it, they'll buy it. Okay. They'll buy Regen. They will. Now, whose definition? And it's kind of real organic all over, writ large. Let's just, who's, who's deciding? Okay. But even if we put Regen aside, Let's say it's just organic. I say just. The thing is, they pay the same price to everybody. The price does not change according to what a farmer did with their soil, what their, what the, the, the quality of the soil, the quality of the crop. There is no difference in what cargo pays. They've commodified organic. And I remember this really well when I started Erwan and then meeting Ted Whitmer in Kalispell, Montana, who grew our hard red winter wheat and so forth. And, and, you know, I mean, he would say, you, you put the wheat in your, and chew it, you know, raw, you know, and then to feel, it was like chewing gum. There was so much, so much gluten in that wheat. It was like chewing gum. Okay. I mean, it was, you could chew it and chew it and chew it. Okay. But, point he made was that our wheat weighs 62, 63 pounds, sometimes 64 pounds, you know, a bushel. And the wheat that's coming in now is 57, 58, 56 pounds. It's a bushel is volumetric. So he said the difference is minerals. Our wheat has minerals in it. Theirs is being, you know, fertilized, you know, the roots aren't going deep, you know, they're picking up a lot of, you know, moisture and so forth. And but even on a dry weight basis, there was a huge influence, uh, a difference in, in, in mineralization. So, so decommodification is important so that you can sell directly to the buyer, not to a middleman. The middleman's purpose or is to facilitate that transaction, but not to put it in big silos and then sell it to somebody who says, oh, we have organic whatever, organic potato chips, organic corn chips, organic, you know, whatever. That's what's going on. And even if it's certified, which is what all this is about, real organics, what about certified by whom and what does it mean? Even if it's certified, there is no delta, no difference in the payment to that farmer for what he or she does to actually improve the soil, to restore carbon in the soil. There is no, absolutely, they don't care. And so decommodification is really important that, so as you have food localization, both on a manufacturing level too, you know, and producing level, not just consumption or farmer's markets and CSAs, that the farmer can connect directly to companies all around that actually will pay a premium for that quality and use that as a way to, brag, frankly, about the quality of their food. The farmer gets more. The, the, the buyer pays less because they've eliminated the middleman. They've disintermediated Cargill. Um, and so it's a win-win for the farmer, for the producer, for the cu- customer. And that's where we have to go. Um, and so when we see, say, a Walmart, you know, who announced that they were going to become a regenerative company, you know. I know Doug well, by the way, and I know he's sincere. He, he really is. He, um, uh, very um, deeply held beliefs about honesty and so forth. He would be the first to say, we don't know how to do it. 
Okay. And so full disclosure, I wrote the speech in 2005 for Lee Scott after going down there and at their invitation and saying, well, what I said to them is they had disaggregated in the environment and social justice. They, they, they were like social justice over there. We're, 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 we're getting interested in the environment now, you know, and they spent two years, you know, studying it and, and realizing they had to do something. And they had hired me as a consultant for a huge amount of money, by the way. And I flew down there and I met with the top brass and Doug was there, by the way. And Lee Scott and, you know, um, Eduardo Castro and Mike Duke, who became the CEO after Lee. Um, and, uh, to talk about their environmental going forward environmentally. And they were working with EDF and a whole CI and a lot of other groups, but, uh, I was as an individual and, and the first thing I said to them when I got there, I said, I'm not taking any of your money. Just so you know, it's $240,000 for a year. I said, I'm not taking a penny. I don't want it. And Lee said to me, what's the matter? Don't you think our money is good enough for you? He said, no, I got two kids at Ivy League schools. I need every bit of it. But, <laughs> and, um, but I, but I said, I don't want to take it because I want you to believe everything I say. I got nothing on it. You can, you decide what you think, but I'm telling you, I'm just going to go straight to you, you know? And we talked. And this was talked, Walmart. This was Walmart, two thousand five. Yeah. And I said, "Look at you know, um, <laughs> you you you, you got to understand the social justice and climate and environmental justice and environment are the same thing, you know, you, you know." Um, and uh, we talked a lot, and then I wrote. I flew back on my dime, and I wrote uh, Lee a letter iterating what I had said and more. And then I heard that he he carried that letter around for months and months. And, he's, and, and to Jib, who brought me in, he said, is Hawkins serious about this? And he said, yeah, Jib, yeah, he, he's serious. He said, Just checking. He put it back in his coat pocket. And then in October uh, in 2005 or September, I guess, I got, but I got a call from Walmart. It said, oh, I told Lee he should come out on, on the environment. And he said, well, we haven't done anything. Good point. First thing you say, we haven't done a damn thing. Say it. And I said, the next thing you say is, we think we know where North is. Okay. That's what you've been doing for two years. You think we know. Three, help us, watch us, and tell us if we're going in the right direction. I said, that's all you have to say. People just want the truth. We've never, haven't done a thing. We think we know where we have to go. Help us get there. That's enough. Anyway, I, um, they came to me and said, would you write Lee's speech? And, you know, I said, why me? You know, I said, it's gone through 30 versions. He's decided to come out and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I said, well, yeah, okay, but, uh, send me with the content. What do you, what is he saying? What do you, what are you committing to saying? And, and I said, I'll look at it. And they sent it, and 20 minutes later, I sent it back and said, well, no wonder. You're not saying anything. This is just gobbledygook. This is just, you know, empty phrases, cliches. And uh, Lee called me up and said, okay, write the speech I should give. And I said, can I just read that back to you? And <laughs> he said, I said, okay. And so I did. I wrote the speech he should give. And that speech called for 100% renewable energy, zero waste, uh, uh, a rise in the minimum wage, uh, and uh, uh, a, a, a sustainable supply chain. I mean, triple the mileage on your trucks, uh, uh, you know, other things. I just threw it all in there. I said, right, you should give here. I put it, I put as much in as I could. And Lee sent that speech around to everybody. He sent speeches to, I don't know how many hundreds of people. I was told and um, said, what do you think? And every single person except one said, don't you dare give this speech. Don't. One person said, give the speech. And that was Doug McMillan, who is the CEO today. And 
he did give that speech and you can read it it's online it's in 14 books it's a harvard case study business harvard business school case study and and what I said in that is that the environment is Katrina in slow motion, what we're seeing, because they had dealt with Katrina in a really extraordinary way. And, but they are the largest producer of renewable energy in the world on private, on, on private corporate land. They're uh, well over 50%. They are nearly there in terms of waste. Um, they, um, they, they measure every year and they have made extraordinary progress, um, to these goals. Um, and they have committed now to be completely renewable by 2035 to zero, zero, uh, fossil emissions, greenhouse gas emissions by 2040 with no offsets. And that was me talking to them about offsets. Like, do the offsets, but don't use it as a subtractive a subtraction sign. That's, the offsets do good things, but that's not. You know. And uh, we'll see. You know, I mean, they got twenty years to do it. Um, but then, when you, but as I say, that's different because they are, you know, the biggest buyer in the room wherever they go in the world. And so, if they say this is our standard, suppliers listen. And, um, so I think when Doug said that they're to today on September 22nd, today I commit Walmart to be a regenerative company that puts human life at the center of all our business decisions, life and humans at the center of all our business decisions. 6,000 suppliers heard that speech. So yeah, is it, I mean, it's dissemination, it's diffusion, um, you know, when people first do things, I'm not talking about Doug or Walmart now, but I'm just talking about the word regenerative. Um, people are hypocrites. It, it's often the way people learn to tell the truth is to try it out. <laughs> it's true. We're human. <laughs> you know, it sounds good. Hey, people like it. And the person doesn't really believe it. And, 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 but, this is how it's, a, it's how we work. We don't go from A to B overnight, and, yeah. uh, especially in the corporate world um, where there's a lot of fear. So we'll see, you know. It's, so. it's a very important conversation. I have a couple more questions, though. Yeah. I, know, I know I'm taking up your day. But so just first of all, to connect a dot that you made there, two dots, social justice and climate are the same thing. Can you explain that? Sure. What you, in every literate conversation about climate, the word climate justice will come up. Okay. What I'm saying is injustice causes and caused global warming. In other words, don't go to the effect of it, go to the cause. That's where you have to go. You always have to go upstream if you're going to affect things downstream. You can't do anything downstream. It's end of pipe. Now, I'm not saying you can't address injustices that are occurring in terms of place, pollution, impact, and so forth. You can, of course, of course, of course. But the cause is what you want to go to, which is that it, it, it's the, every single industry in the world is extractive. There's no exception. And extraction is the opposite of regeneration. It, extractive harms people and life and place and water and oceans. And so whether you're looking at service industries or looking at you know, manufacturing industries or technology industries or food, ag, clothing, whatever, they're all extractive. And so the injustice is right there at the beginning, which is they're based on the idea that you can take something from a place and from the future and from someone or someone whose land you stole, right? And call that progress. And it's not progress, it's degeneration. So we've all grown up with it. We take it for granted. People buy shares and companies that do that and see their shares go up in value. 
every single philanthropy in the United States does that. <laughs> um, that's the system we're in. So addressing justice with respect to climate is the key to that pivot, which is what is a regenerative industry? Interesting question. And that question is what has to be asked. Sustainable is not the right question. Because furthermore, further, it doesn't even exist. You know, it's Zeno's paradox. Sustainability is like, well, who's to say? I mean, it doesn't exist in nature and it doesn't exist in, in the world in any shape, manner, or form. And the only time it was used is when it was it placed without permission on my book, The Ecology of Commerce. It said a declaration of sustainability. I never said that. That word isn't in the book once. So I've been I've been consistent about this since nineteen that was published in ninety three, you know, like sustainability. No, I don't think so. I understand what people are saying and what they mean in their intention, which is great, you know, in most cases. But so um, the only thing that makes sense now is regeneration. It, there is no, you know, where the teeter totter is perfectly balanced between taking and, 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 and restoring, you know, ah, uh, no, the earth doesn't work that way. And, um, so I see this as a, 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 a real opening in, in that sense because, and, uh, and every industry can become regenerative. It can. It really can. And so to create an enlarged sense of possibility is what regeneration does. Sustainability often created a sense of conforming or limits or, you know, to strictures or if you, if you didn't do this, then, you know, you were, you weren't sustainable. Okay. You know, I mean, binary kind of thing, which is understandable. Regenerative is also binary in that sense. But, but regeneration is actually about expanding possibility. I mean possibility in the biggest sense of the word because there's no regeneration of place unless there's of people. There's no regeneration of people unless there's place, you know. I mean, so social structures, you know, economic structures, I mean, our educational structures and so forth. I mean, that's the shift that is happening. I think it's going to grow exponentially. And I think the driver of it is going to be our ally weather. Uh, because the degeneration, you can see the end of that road. That road doesn't go much further. You know, some people still want to drive down further down the road. See ya. But I mean, it, you know, it, it's the end of the line. And, and that's what global warming is telling us. It's like, you know, no, you can't go more, you can't go farther down there. So people are understanding that and corporations are understanding that governments are understanding that committing to net zero and all that sort of stuff, which is fantastic, by the way, accepting that net zero is not a goal either. It's like another sustainability. It's like net zero at what level of CO2 in the atmosphere and greenhouse gases, you know, you know, 480, 460, 500. I mean, you know, that's climate chaos, and we know that already. So re uh, regeneration is really the, you know, takes it f much further than the idea of net zero or uh, or sustainability. Um, and the thing about it is the in the in the innovation that's going on right now is, is really, uh, I just think, just you know, exploding in, in this area. And I, I even call regenerative agriculture an emerging technology. It's really emerging technique. You know, technology is a, kind of a loaded term now, but it's an emerging technique. And the number of people in the world, you know, what you're seeing at, with Nigel Sharp in, 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 in Tiverton in Australia has discovered a way to make the best wool regeneratively on land that is restoring quals and bandicoots that have, are endangered species in Australia. I mean, it's just, and so you're, it, it's not just like respecting biodiversity or not killing it. He's actually bringing back these extraordinary creatures that are wiped out by the colonists, you know, by their foxes and rabbits eating all the food and, you know, other things. Um, and starting to look at, at farming in this way 
as a way to bring back the, the, the flora and fauna that was wiped out in Australia. We, Australia really is a, got desertified by, uh, not weather, by, by, by the Europeans, you know, by their farming techniques and by all the things that they introduced there. And so now you have a movement there. Now it's, it's, it's growing quickly. And Nigel Sharp is a business person. Uh, it's not that he's making money off it so much. He's saying, if we can't show how to do this in such a way that it's profitable and that you would do this rather than that, then it's not going to happen. And that's what he's done. And so that's just one small example, I think, of the kind of innovation that's going on all around the world that we don't hear about because we all tend to stay in our, even in our regen bubbles, <laughs> in regenerative yeah. bubbles. Yeah. So can we make the word regeneration, can we go back just for a moment? Yeah. And like we've set aside the word sustainable for a minute and let's set aside regenerative ag for a minute yeah, and just yeah. talk about regeneration. And you've thought about it a lot. So when you're talking about that, tell me what that means to you. Well, it's a default mode of life. Um, and the, 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 the importance of being outside, you know, I said earlier about being outside is that the moment you stop burning, cutting, you know, scraping, poisoning, whatever you're doing out there, which we are doing, uh, and stop, nature regenerates. And we are life. And I would say, and I'm, many people would gain say this one, <laughs> but it's the default mode of, of human nature as well. Mm. So what we're calling upon is our there's a Jack Cornfield is on my board and his teacher um, where he studied a monastery in Thailand um, uses the phrase the one who knows. Okay. Everybody has the one who knows. Has it been polluted, covered up, confused, manipulated, exploited, seduced? Yeah, no question. The one who knows is still there. It didn't leave. And so to me, regeneration is this dance between different life forms. We're a life form, right? Um, extraordinarily destructive life form. Um, and all the rest of life that is not Homo sapiens. And it's this there calling to us, teaching us, beckoning, offering with such kindness and generosity and all we need to do, the one who knows is kind and generous. It's innate. That's how we got here. Um, and we wouldn't be here if we weren't, you know. And um, so that's what regeneration means to me. It calls upon the deepest, deepest... Uh, um, what, um, well, not just deep, but the, the truest, um, it, it, it's not the impulse or impetus, but it's the, the, the very quality of life itself is regenerative. And so it, when we act upon it, whether it's a farm or, or, or in any way outside, so to speak, then we actually enliven it and bring it to life within ourselves. And we see differently, we act differently, we talk differently. Uh, we don't try to be right, we don't blame, we don't shame. And we understand that listen, to think is to listen. That's what thinking is. And there's 
two thing, two main areas would be the, to me the one, but you know, which listen outside. What is it telling us? Shut up and listen. <laughs> be quiet. Be silent. Take time. Be still. But we have to listen to each other as well, and we're not listening, right? And because we think we're right, and so one of the things I try to do in my writing is not be right. And I'm not interested in being right because it makes somebody wrong. Um, I'm interested in telling truth, you know, but I want to tell it as a description, like describe something, but not as opinion, not as an evaluation, not as a reaction, not as an adverbial phrase that sort of lords it over somebody who's stupid enough to do something, you know, that way of which you see everywhere in, 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 in the media and, and, you know, and it it doesn't work. It doesn't work to talk to each other that way, you know? And so I see regeneration as our deepest, uh, most beautiful impulse as human beings that encompasses everything we touch, see, and do. All right, Paul, I have a lot of other questions, but I think that's a pretty spectacular place to end. So we'll have another interview sometime to go on. Uh, Thank you, Paul Hawken. It was always a pleasure. This was great. Uh, Well, Dave, I want to thank you. Uh, In my writing, I find, not everywhere, but I find people like you, uh, like you in the sense that they're doing what, needs to be done they're doing it with limited resources and they're doing it with a whole other being and with the integrity and and kindness that is not so evident in the world when you read about it in the world you know and the, what you're doing at real organic is just extraordinary and i just want as somebody who started in organics when i was a lad you know, 19 years old and, uh, and watched it go, um, be corrupted, frankly, uh, and try to create standards. And I just think that what you're doing is so, so important. I just want to say you have my deepest gratitude, um, you and all you, you work with and all that you're doing and for this, um, conference seminar, you know, but, for everything you've done before and I know everything you'll do uh, going forward and I'm really uh, grateful to be your friend. Thank you, Paul. You're, you're <laughs> That's the nicest thing anyone said to me all day and then people said really nice things today, so thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you like what you heard today and will subscribe to our podcast. Tell your friends about it And leave us a review on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you found us. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to today's conversation, can be found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode two. Please join us next time for an interview with chef, author, and seed company founder Dan Barber. To find a real organic farm near you, visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farms.